निज भक्ति जोगा शिक्षा तमे का पुरुष पुराना श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य शरीर धारी कृपाम बुद्धिच समाहम प्रवर्ति This is a prayer offering to Lord Chaitanya. The central figure dancing a boy about 18 years old. He introduced this movement, Sankirtan movement, being compassionate with the fallen souls of the saints. He recommended. He recommended from the authorized scriptures, not that he manufactured. Nowadays, it has become a fashion to manufacture a certain type or system of religious or yoga principle. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not do that. What he introduced, that is recommended in the scriptures, that in this age, for spiritual realization, one may simply chant the holy name of Krishna. Krishna means God. If you have got any other name for God, you can chant that also. It is not that uh, you have to chant Krishna, but Krishna means God. The word meaning of Krishna means all attractive. Krishna from His beauty, all attractive. From His strength, He is all attractive. From his philosophy, he is all attracted. From his renunciation, he is all attracted. From his fame, he is all attracted. Five thousand years before, Krishna spoke this Bhagavad Gita. He is still going strong. He is so famous. And Krishna claims that sarva jyoni shukantya oh, most of you must have read bhagavad gita and in the 14th chapter you find the krishna says my dear arjuna in all species of life there may be as many varieties of form we are all living entity here even even in human society we have got different types of forms. Nobody will be exactly like the form of other gentlemen. That is different. This is the beauty of creation. If you go to a tree, there are millions and billions of leaves, and you won't find one leaf exactly like that. So, there are varieties of living entities. Out of the varieties of the living entities, the humankind living entities are very small. From Shastra, from scripture we understand that there are eight million four hundred thousand species of life. Eight million four hundred thousand species of life. Out of that, aquatics, water animals or water living entities are nine hundred thousand. The botanists or the physiologists, how many they have seen or how many they have experimented or how many we have seen, but. From this Hastra, from the Vedic scripture, we find that there are 900 
thousands of species of life in the water. And uh, uh, two million uh, species of life in the botanical department. Uh, similarly, there are birds, there are bees, there are four-legged animals, and at last the human being. The human life is considered to be the developed form of all species of life. Darwin's theory also uh, some idea, gives some idea. I think he might have taken this idea from Vedic literature. But uh, <coughs> the gradual evolution is recommended, uh, is, uh, I mean to say, mentioned in the Vedic literature that uh, from aquatic to plant life, then worms life, then birds life, then animal life. Uh, there are thirty, uh, three hundred thousands of animal life. So at last this human form of life. And the human form of life, there are many species, some of them civilized, some of them not civilized, uh, some of them have no religion, but we can know from the history of human civilization that any civilized nation, it doesn't matter whether he is Christian, whether he is Mohammedan, or he is Hindu, or Buddhist, there is some type of religion. So, uh, in the Vedic literature says that without religion, without accepting religion, uh, dharmena hina pasibhi samana. If in some society there is no religion, religion means to abide by the laws of the Supreme. That is it. It doesn't matter whether it is Christian religion or Mohammedan religion or Hindu religion. Religion means just like citizens, good citizens. Good citizen means who abides by the law of the state. It doesn't matter what he is. Similarly, anyone, either he may be Christian or may be Mohammedan or may be Hindu, that doesn't matter. Anyone who accepts the supreme law, God, and abides by the laws of God, the laws of nature, he is called. Uh, religionist or an advanced human But Krishna says either advanced or not advanced, that doesn't matter. It is a kind of grace only, but I am the father. Just like father is the seed-giving agent into the womb of the mother, and then the child, baby, comes out. Without the combination of father and mother, there is no possibility of generation. Similarly, Krishna says that in all species of life, the living entities, I am the seed-giving father and this material nature is the mother. Nobody can deny because our this body, just like the child's body, is made by the mother. Oh, father gives the opportunity to develop the body. Oh, and the mother supplies the ingredients for developing the body. Similarly, God impregnates. God impregnates material nature with living entities and they come out in different forms. Aquatics, birds, bees, animals, uh, trees, plants, vegetables, so many. And Krishna says that I am the father of all of them. So my uh, request to you, 
that don't accept Krishna as something Indian God or Hindu God. No. Krishna is the original father of all living entities. He claims if you don't accept, uh, if the father says, uh, you are my son, and the son says, no, I am not your son, or there is son, he may deny it. Uh, he doesn't believe his mother. Now, what is the proof that one man is my father? The mother is the proof. There is no other source of understanding who is my father. If a boy wants to understand who is my father, the only authority is the mother. Mother, he says, my dear boy, my dear child, here, here, here is your father. You have to accept. If you say, I don't accept, I must have proof that he is my father. How is it possible? It is not possible. <laughs> Similarly, the Vedic literature is to be considered as the mother. And Vedic literature says, Janmadha Sagataha, the supreme absolute truth is that who is the source of all generations, all emanations. And what is the source? Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that I am the power. See, if you believe scriptures, Vedic literature, if you believe Bhagavad Gita, then you have to accept Krishna as the Supreme Father because the mother, Vedic literature is considered to be the mother, he, he, she gives evidence that Krishna is the power. Just like mother gives evidence who is a, your father, similarly, the Vedic literature is considered to be mother. And the Vedic literature says that Krishna is the father. And in your Christian literature and Bible, Jesus Christ is accepted as the Son of God. He presented himself as Son of God. And here Krishna says that I am the Father. So there is no contradiction. The Son of God also says about God and the Father also says about the God Himself. The Son of God, Son of God says that you uh, surrender unto God and God says you surrender unto me. Then where is there is contradiction? There is no contradiction. So, uh, see, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement is uh, to understand the path. It is nothing new. It is old. But in a new process, convenient for the people of this age. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we have forgotten our path. Uh, we have forgotten God. The modern civilization, wherever you go, they say, oh, uh, that uh, we are secular state. Secular state. Secular state means uh, without knowing who is the father of the mankind. That is secular state. Uh, but uh, the Sarvamoha Bhattacharya, a great logician, during the time of Lord Chaitanya. He was also godless, and generally the so-called learned philosophers, scientists, or so-called educated, they deny the existence of God. They depend more or less on their experimental knowledge of science. But actually, the fact is that there is God. There is God. <coughs> In every religion they accept there is God. 
And actually the fact is there is God in the Vedic literature, it is accepted, Janmāsya-sajata, and in the Bhagavad-gītā it is clearly said by Krishna that I am the Father. Not only one place, in many other places. I am especially referring to the Bhagavad-gītā because most of you, you are acquainted with the study of Bhagavad-gītā. Uh, similarly, in the tenth chapter you will find Aham Sarvasya Prabhava. I am the origin of everything. Aham Sarvasya Prabhava, Matta Sarvam Pravartate, whatever you see that is from me. Iti Aham Sarvasya Prabhava, Matta Sarvam Pravartate, Iti Matya Bhajanti Mana Buddha Bhava Sabanita. One who understands this perfectly, one has to understand. Uh, it is not that you blindly follow something, one has to understand. So Krishna says, one who has understood that I am the origin of everything, <laughs> Buddha. Buddha means one who is learned. And Bhava Samanita. Bhava Samanita means with thoughts. Not that uh, whimsically or sentimentally uh, to accept something, but with thought, with thoughtful uh, uh, attitude or more. One who has understood this fact, the Buddha Bhava Samanita, he uh, worships me. These things are there. So, Sarvabhama uh, Bhattacharya, you are the great logician. He was unfaithful, not a, he was moralist, but he had no faith in God or in personality. There are many persons who have faith in something superior or absolute, but they do not believe in the personal nature of God. But here, from the Bhagavad Gita, we can clearly understand, from Bhagavata we can clearly understand, from Vedanta philosophy we clearly understand that God is person, a person like you and me. Take for example, in the Vedanta Sutra, the first aphorism is the first sutra is Adhata Brahma Jignasa. Now you have to understand what is Brahma or what is the absolute truth. The next aphorism is immediately that the absolute truth is that from whom everything emanates. The original source of all emanation. Janma dasyataha. Janma, janma means birth. Adi means etc. The janma where there is birth, there is death, and there is existence. And whenever there is birth, you must know there is death <coughs> also. Uh, there is not a single instance you have got experience where Birth is possible and death is not possible. This material world is going on in that way. Birth, then existence, then development, then byproduct, then dwindling, then vanishing. Six changes. Everything, either take your this body or a fruit or a flower, anything material you take, these six changes are there. First of all, birth, then growth, then existence, then byproduct, then dwindling, and then vanish. So Vedanta Sutra says, Janmārda Sujata, the original source of birth, the uh, source of maintenance, the source of growth, the source of development, and the uh, source of dwindling, and after all uh, uh, vanishing, or the 
Uh, the conservation of the vanishing element, everything is the supreme Brahma. So this Janmarda Saslo has been interpreted in various ways, but uh, the most important commentator is Vyasri. He is the original writer of Vedanta Sutras. Not only he is the writer of Vedanta Sutra, he is the writer of all Vedic literature. Vedic literature means four Vedas, Shama, Tharva, Yoju, and Rik. And from the Vedas there are uh, Upanishads. There are not 108 Upanishads. And there are Puranas. Puranas means those who will not understand the Vedic aphorism and the uh, Upanishad, a statement of the Upanishad. For them, for ordinary man, there are many stories. The stories are concluded with the Vedanta Sutra. Then there is Mahabharata. You have heard this, all these names. Mahabharata, the history. History of Indian uh, royalty. The Mahabharata is the history of fighting between two Greek groups of royal family, the Pandavas and the Kuru. And in that Mahabharata you find all kinds of sociology, politics, religion, and military science, everything is completed. And in that Mahavarata is for this Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is only a portion of the Mahavarata. This was also written by Vyasadeva. There are, at last, he was not satisfied. Uh, even after writing so many big literatures, he was not satisfied. So one day he was sitting very morose, and uh, at the same time his spiritual master Narada came to see him. Because Narada is not an ordinary spiritual master, he could understand that my disciple is sitting morose, so I must give, I must go there and give him some uh, encouragement because he is a great uh, personality. He is uh, giving human society so many nice things, but he is not very happy in his mood, so I shall go and give him some encouragement. So I am reading from the Bhagavad uh, this uh, I mean, it's the introduction. How Bhagavad was compiled by Vyasadeva. Uh, I am reading that chapter. This is in the first canto, fifth chapter. So when the spiritual master Nara came, it is the custom of disciple to receive him and to give him nice seat and uh, offer obeisances and then uh, um, talk on different subject matters. So when Narada came, Vyasadeva offered him good seat and comfortable seat and offered his obediences. Then uh, Narada is speaking. He saw his disciple, Vyasadeva, very much morose. So he is asking, Parasarja Mahabhava, Bhavata Kuchita Atmana Puritusati Sharira Atma Manasa Eva Ba. My dear Vyasadev, I see that you are not very happy. <coughs> but I am asking you a question whether a person becomes ever happy who has accepted this body as self or the mind as self. There are two classes of men in the material world. 
uh, I mean the intelligent class. I'm not speaking of the ordinary class of men. Those who are interested in knowledge, in higher thoughts, in philosophy, in religion, ethics, morality, so many things there are in science, in literature. So best day is everything in one person. And he has written so many books as I described. Now Narod is asking him, my dear, Parasarbha. Parasarbha means Vasudev was the son of Parasha. His father's name was Parasha. Therefore, he is addressing him, Parasarbha Mahabhava. Mahabhava. You are very fortunate. You have got the opportunity of doing the best service to the humanity by presenting such important literatures. Therefore you are Mahabhava. The human society is not ordinary task. I'm not, it is not possible for any ordinary man. Uh, all great men, all great, uh, I mean, say, personality who had appeared on this earth and rendered great service to the humanity, they are still remembered. <coughs> Just like in your country, President George Washington, he rendered very valuable service to your country, he still remembers. Uh, recently, President Kennedy, he still remembers. Similarly, those persons who have dedicated their life for the welfare of the human society, they are not ordinary. Therefore, he is addressed as Mahabhava, the most fortunate personality, because he dedicated his life for the good of the humanity. The greater a man is engaged for his service to the humanity, he is considered the great man. Similarly, uh, uh, Lord Chaitanya, he also renounced this world. You see, his future is just eighteen years to twenty years born. And after this movement, Sankirtan movement at Navadvip, uh, during his householder life, uh, he was married at the age of seventeen years. So he was considered to be a householder. And his first wife died at the age of twenty years. Then his mother requested to marry again, so he married again at the age of twenty years. And but he took sannyas at the age of twenty-four years. He renounced the order of I mean the household life in twenty-four when he was only twenty-four years old. His wife was only sixteen years old. And his mother was about seventy years old. But still he took sannyas. Why? For the good of the human. He was very well to do. He was Brahmin. He was learned. And he had many followers. And he still, when he saw that if I remain a householder and they will not care for my instruction, therefore he, he was obliged to accept the sannyas order. Because in India the system is a sannyasi, a renounced order, a gentleman in renounced order, he is accepted as spiritual instructor. So this Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also dedicated his life for the uh, whole humanity. In his preaching there is clear statement uh, why he was preaching this moment all over India. He instructed every Indian. The exact verse in Bengali language is that, Bharat Pumite Janma Manusha Janma Hila Ja Janma Shartha Kari Karo Paropaka. He has ordered that anyone who has taken his birth in India as a human, human form of life, 
he must take up this responsibility of preaching this Sankirtan movement all over the world to do the best service to the humanity. That is his order. To do the best service to the humanity. You are so much compassionate with the human society. So by his grace, his philosophy, his teaching are now being spread in the Western countries. Uh, and I have taken up the humble responsibility. Please help me. You will be happy. It is such a nice movement. Uh, so uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he was also humanity. He is not a religious. He was not meant for preaching a particular cult to gather some followers. No. It is the need of the human society. And he wanted to preach all over the world. And because it was not possible at that time in his and he lived only for forty eight years. He took sannyas at the age of twenty four years and he passed away in twenty four years. He was very busy all over India. Therefore he left his legacy to the Indian, any Indian, to take up this cause and preach this uh, cult of Sankirtan movement all over the world. So uh, I shall request you to understand the philosophy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his movement. Uh, we have got already six centers. Uh, five centers in your country. Uh, uh, I started first in 1966, July, in New York. Then I started in San Francisco. Then uh, at Boston. Then at Montreal. Of course, I did not go everywhere. These boys, the sincere boys and girls, were helping me uh, to join this movement. They are doing. This center was started also by one boy. I have come for the first time here. Now I request you that this movement is not nothing sectarian or anything blah. It is the movement as a necessity of the human society. You judge it, you consider it, you put your logic arguments in every way you will find that this is the necessity of the present day. So not only one center in Los Angeles, but you open center in every village, every country, every home. And the, the, the process is very simple. You chant Hare Krishna and dance in ecstasy, and everything will come within yourself gradually. Everything will come. You will practically feel how you are becoming reformed. Uh, there is no need of uh, wasting time. This Hare Krishna movement can be done at home, outside home, <laughs> when you are working, when you are walking, every moment. So try to understand this movement and try to follow it. Uh, it is not sectarian, it is a need. Uh, I shall discuss all this part gradually. Uh, if you kindly come and attend our classes, I shall be very much thank you. Thank you very much. If there is any question, you can ask. Yes. What should be the question that you 
What should you be thinking about when you're chanting? What, what are you asking? What do you think about when you're chanting? Chanting? You simply hear what is when you say Hare Krishna. You try to hear the very sound, Hare Krishna. That's all. Nothing more. This is meditation. Your tongue and your ear should be engaged in sounding this transcendental vibration, Hare Krishna, best meditation. This is also accepted in Bhagavad Gita, the uh, best meditation. You don't keep your mind elsewhere. You keep your mind on the chanting, Hare Krishna, and here. So this is uh, responsive. When I was chanting, you are hearing when you are chanting, you are chanting, I was hearing. So it is exchange. I hear chant, your chanting, you hear my chanting. This is the process. So there is no possibility of thinking anything else. Best and the easiest type of meditation. And good. Factual you at once become on the transcendental plane. Uh, therefore you feel dancing. You see? So practice it and you'll see how spiritually you are making it all. And it's very simple. When you are walking on the street, you can chant Hare Krishna. There is no tax, there is no expenditure, there is no loss. But the gain is very great. Why don't you try? If without any loss, without any expenditure, you gain something, the supermost sublime thing, spiritual realization, why don't you try for it? We are not asking any money. We are not asking two hundred and fifty dollars for paying, for hearing. No. It is freely distributed. Please take it and try it, make an experiment. There is no business here. You simply chant Hare Krishna and try to hear the sound. That's all. Nothing. Any other question? Therefore it is blue. Krishna is blue. That would be. Sky is the reflection of Krishna's bodily effulgence. Therefore it is blue. Just like if the power of the light is blue or, <coughs> I mean to say, um, red, the uh, radiance also becomes similarly. Krishna is blue. It is described in the Vedic literature. Venum kannantam aravinda dalayata aksham varahavatam sammasitam vidasundaram. God's bodily hue is 
just like Louis Cloud, but it's very beautiful. These are not imagination, they are taken from Vedic literature. So his bodily uh, nature is like that, therefore he is blue. It is not that we have painted blue by imagination, no. It is authority. Venum karmantam, he is always engaged. He is God, therefore he is always enjoying playing flute. Oh, he hasn't got to do anything. And there is a stated in the Vedic literature, Parasya Sati Vividha Yogasriyati, Natasya Tarjam Karamanja Vidya. God has nothing to do. What? Uh, and then what kind of God is it? He has to mark. This is Vedic literature. Parasya Sati. He has got immense energies there doing everything. Just like a big man, a rich man. He is sitting silently in his room, but his assistants, his secretaries, his managers are doing something. He will find Krishna always in Jnana, uh, Ananda Maya Vyasa, these are Vedanta Sutra. He is jolly by his nature. And if we associate with him, then he becomes jolly. We are also part and parcel of Krishna. Now we are materially encumbered, therefore we have to transfer again from these material encumbrances to spiritual life. That is Krishna call. So Krishna is blue because he is described in the Vedic literature as such. Why you are here now? Yeah. Why you are here now in this store? I was born. No, I mean it's in this room. Learn. Uh, learn. So that is your choice. You have come to learn here. So you have got little independence. Because you are part and parcel of Supreme. The Supreme has got complete independence. Therefore the independence quality is there also in you. Just like gold. A particle of gold is also gold. Similarly, because you are particle of Krishna, so you have got all the qualities in minute quantity also. You have got all the qualities of Krishna. And Krishna is, God is fully independent. Therefore you want to be independent. Your intuition is to always to remain independent. But you have been conditioned. Oh. You have been conditioned. When you regain your spiritual life, you also become as independent as Krishna. So that independence, when we want to imitate Krishna by misusing our independence, then we are given the chance of so-called 